So yeah, so my name's Serena McFadgen. For those people that don't know me, I'm a scientist based at CSIRO in Canberra. I'm currently seconded to the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, also in Canberra. Um, the research that I've been involved in over the last 10 years or so has really been focused on invertebrate pest management, mainly in broadacre grains production systems across southern Australia. And that involves really focused work on entomology and the ecology of species in those production landscapes. So when I got a chance to go on the Global Focus Tour in 2018, it was a really great opportunity for me to take a broader look at agriculture around the world and really get some insight into how um, ag producers and ag businesses are viewing some of the global agricultural challenges that we're all facing. And this can be quite different to the way that scientists view those same challenges. So I want to start off by thanking CSIRO for supporting me to go on the trip. And I also want to thank the people that were on my Brazil tour in 2018. These were a really inspirational group of people to travel around with for eight weeks. So thank you. Uh, so today what I want to talk about is pest management in the next 20 years and what are some of the patterns that I think will occur in the future in relation to invertebrate pest management in particular. I want to start off though by talking about some of the global patterns that we saw both during my trip and afterwards. I think it's fairly safe to say that pesticides have been very effective in reducing production losses due to pests in some parts of the world. But there's some trends or changes that are occurring that make me think the way we've used pesticides in the last 50 years is not going to be the same way that we use pesticides in the next 20 years going forward. Everywhere we went, biosecurity and the relationship between biosecurity practices and international trade was really a, a very important driver for change in businesses, both on farm and also during production chains. In 2018, the EU instigated a ban on all outdoor uses of three commonly used neonicotinoid insecticides. One of those three includes imidacloprid, which is a very commonly used seed dressing here in Australia. After that, 242 scientists wrote an open letter encouraging policymakers and regulators in other countries to follow the EU's example. And this ban came about really in response to um, impacts on pollinator health that were being seen across Europe, and also some pretty clear data showing that some of these neonicotinoids end up in the soil and then can move into the waterways, and we're having impacts there. We've also seen some really quite high profile glyphosate herbicide bans around the world. And these types of bans come about due to some data related to the risks that people are seeing to human health and the environment, but equally important is the perception of risks to human health and the environment. And this can be a really important driver for change when we think about regulation of certain pesticides. We've also seen an increase in continual development of resistance to some of our key pesticide groups in some important pest species around the world. And resistance development occurs as a result of evolution combined with an environment where individuals or individual insects within a population are favoured if they have traits that allow them to withstand certain insecticide groups. So what we've been doing for many years, ever since we've started farming and using pesticides in our farming practices, is we've really been creating very ideal environments for the development of resistance in pest species. And this graph shows you the number of unique cases of resistance across time. The black line shows you the insect species. And you can see since the first documented case in 1914, there's just been a continual um, increase in the numbers of cases of resistance that's been reported. <coughs> So I don't see this pattern changing. The only way it's going to change if we decide to change the environment that these particular species are exposed to going forward. There are other challenges. The insecticides that we have in, in Australia are actually relatively cheap in relation to all of our farm inputs, and they're going to continue to remain cheap. Um, more selective options will continue to remain relatively more expensive. And while some people might be thinking, great, we've got cheap insecticides. I see this as a real challenge, especially when we think about investment in the research and development needs for alternate practices going forward. Um, and it also means there's no economic driver for change here um, that's, you know, at the farm level anyway. We also know that conventional crop breeding practices mean that the plants that we're managing in our um, farms at the moment are inherently more susceptible to damage by especially invertebrate pests. This is a pretty common pattern, but just to give you an example, um, this is a study that a PhD student, Joshua Douglas, did from the University of Melbourne. Um, what he did was expose lupin plants in a controlled environment to Portuguese millipedes. What he found was that 
the wild type lupin um, had the lowest feeding from the Portuguese millipede, whereas the conventional lupins experienced the highest feeding in this controlled trial. And we think this is because the wild type lupins have these defensive compounds, whereas those defensive compounds are low or absent in some of the conventional varieties. Obviously, there's a whole range of factors that contribute to whether or not a millipede is going to cause significant damage that leads to yield loss within a commercial field situation, but this is one of the important factors that we're seeing. So what are the solutions going forward? What I'm going to do today is just quickly run through a few options for solutions, and I'm going to put, this, put them on this very stylized R&D development pipeline from the initial research and discovery phase through to development and then commercially available products. Um, and I don't just mean products you can buy off the shelf, I also mean practices or techniques that are available for use right now by farmers through to discontinuation. And just to give you some practical examples, we've got a whole range of conventional insecticides that are available for use. As I've said, some of those are being discontinued through regulatory changes, and there's very few coming through the development pipeline, which I'll talk about more. We also have GM cotton that's used quite commonly in Australia and expresses a BT gene that controls lepidopterous pests. And I also want to point out that there's a whole range of organisations involved in the R&D pipeline, but they broadly fall into public R&D organisations or private R&D organisations. And there's sometimes collaboration between public-private partnerships as well. But these groups have very different drivers for how they decide where they're going to invest money in different research and development areas. So in the public space, you're addressing problems from a diversity of different stakeholders, not just farmers. And you're also focused on non-commercial products, so that may be techniques or practices. Whereas in the private R&D context, you're more focused on product evaluation and really addressing a commercial opportunity that you see within the market. So let's start off by talking about new insecticide products with novel modes of action. So I think that there's very few uh, products with novel modes of action coming onto the market in the next few years. So even though you might have potentially hundreds of different insecticide products, insecticides fall into 25 different mode of action classes. And those mode of action classes just really describe how that particular chemical kills an insect. So that might be... Um, uh, influencing nerve signal transduction or binding with proteins in the midgut or some other technique. And even though we have lots of products, we actually only have 25 different modes of action. And a fundamental part of a resistance management strategy is to try to select products that have very different modes of action um, to try to attack insects in different ways. So you, while you might see new products on the market all the time, the idea of having a product that has a truly novel mode of action is, is fairly unlikely at this stage. I think RNA interference or RNAi or gene silencing has the potential to deliver new modes of action in the future. I'm not going to go into the technical details of some of these technologies because I'm more interested in the applications, but just in a broad sense, RNAi actually stops expressions of a gene that leads to the mortality of an invertebrate. Uh, RNAi has been around for a long time. It's been used as a research tool for many, many years. It's, it's not novel in an experimental sense. But in terms of turning that research tool into a method that we can use to control insects, it's had a lot of issues. And those issues have been mainly around the delivery mechanism. So RNA is very fragile in the environment, it breaks down really quickly, and it's hard to get it into an insect to have an effect. But over the recent couple of years, we've seen movement in this front. Um, there's been a products around bioclay that have been developed that look really promising in terms of being able to protect RNA eye constructs so that you can spray them out on the field. And there's also been a double-stranded RNA expressed within a plant, um, and this is a, a GM solution. So in 2017, the US approved, um, in late 2017, the US approved this SmartStax Pro product, which is a GM corn that has this double-stranded RNA that silences the SNF7 gene in Western corn rootworm. And I don't know how widespread that is at the moment, but um, it, it's definitely almost available for use. As I said, we've got a proof of concept of RNAi plus a number of delivery mechanisms that look promising. The area where I think we have not done heaps of research was actually on new modes of action. So the discovery of those new modes of action that can be plugged into an RNAi system in order to kill invertebrates. And I would note um, there is a controlled study that's been released recently on a research station that has shown you can get resistance to the uh, SNF7 double-stranded RNA in this particular product already, even though it hasn't come onto the market. So we still need to develop resistance management strategies for these types of approaches. 
Gene drives I'm only going to touch on briefly. Gene drives are incredibly complicated and have a, a whole range of different applications. Essentially, their genetic engineering approaches involving selfish genetic elements, and they enforce inheritance of a trait on a population. It, uh, Matthias Legros at CSIRO has been working on some modelling to try to understand whether it would be possible to use gene drives to reverse resistance or push susceptibility back through populations. Um, but I think we're really at the very early discovery phase when it comes to this type of technology. We're really just in a modelling construct trying to understand whether we could use this tool safely to manage agricultural pests. There's some work going into using gene drives to control malaria and mosquitoes, and I think we really need to see what happens in that space before you're going to see much movement for ag pest management. The commercialisation and application opportunities here are really uncertain going forward. So I do think we still need to invest uh, R&D funding into this area of research, but I think you need to be realistic about how long the pipeline is there before you'll see something commercially available for use. I think breeding for host plant resistance to invertebrate pests is almost the opposite area. I think this is highly feasible. It's been used for disease management for many, many years, but has really not been used very much for invertebrate pest management. Um, we don't test for tolerance uh, to pests. It's not routinely tested for in any of our pre-breeding or breeding activities, so often we don't know if host plants are actually any good at controlling pests before they leave the, the, um, the development pipeline. Generally, this has a long development pipeline, but it can be done fairly reliably. And with some of the new gene editing approaches that are starting to be developed, you can actually speed up that pipeline quite significantly. So just to give you an example of that, and there are many of these, um, Russian wheat aphid, which recently came into Australia, there are known resistance genes within cereal plants for Russian wheat aphid It's yeah, in other countries. And it's just a matter of I'm highly oversimplifying this, but transferring those genes to Australian wheat and barley varieties so that, that we have that resistance in the varieties that are used in our field. I think we could do a lot more work on understanding tolerance in commercially available varieties, so where you see variation between varieties, what's going on there and why. And I think we could do a lot more work on uh, in the discovery phase in documenting resistance genes in plants and how those could be used to actually control pests using host plant resistance. I think one of the highlights of my trip was going to Simit in Mexico. Simit's been a powerhouse of uh, wheat breeding for many, many years, and of the hundreds of trials that we saw um, in Mexico, there was one where they were uh, screening some of their lines for resistance to aphids. So they are starting to look at these types of approaches for invertebrate pest management. I think the real area where we've got a lot of um, options is, is ways to change the environment. As I said before, resistance is just a combination of evolution and the environment, and we really just need to change the environment as much as we can. One of the key factors there is reducing the use of pesticides. There's a whole range of different things I could list here, but at the moment I've just focused on two. One of those is using predictive models that are linked to climate to really make sure that you're targeting spray pesticide applications effectively and you're not uh, spraying when you don't need to. And there's also a whole range of organic practices, and we saw, albeit at a limited scale, a number of organic producers that were managing pests very effectively. And I would note that some of the commonly used organic biopesticides can be used in conventional uh, farms. There's no reason why they can't be. I think when, on the development pipeline, the predictive models for pests, we've got some that are in development. We've also got some that are uh, commercially available as well. Um, we also need to focus on rotating exercise with different modes of action. This is a, a, a message you've probably heard before, but I'm going to repeat it again. The CropLife uh, website has a range of resistance management plans, so if you're interested, you can go there and download resistance management plans for particular pests. We have a well-established GM cotton refuge strategy that, again, um, is actually quite well used by farmers, so I've sat it in that commercial box. Unfortunately, we have little to no research knowledge about refuge strategies for seed dressings, and uh, seed dressings are very ubiquitous in a, in a range of our production landscapes, so I think this is a real gap in our knowledge that could lead to some problems further down the line. Natural enemies are the areas where I'm probably most passionate and spent the most of my time. So these are predators and parasitic wasps that attack a range of pest species. And there's a huge range of options here about how these can be used in a commercial setting. Um, we've got conservation practices for natural enemies that are in development or commercially available. You've also got natural enemies that are available for purchase that are more useful in a closed production system. 
And when we were in California, we went to a citrus nursery owner who has his own little insectary. Uh, he rears these parasitoid wasps for release into their own glass houses. The butternut pumpkin there is just a substrate on which the scale insect grows. And then the wasps um, survive within that scale insect. On the photo on the right, you may be able to just see those little dots on the glass there. They're the wasps that can then be released into the glass house. And so although this is a very um, low-tech solution, it is a, a really good way for this particular producer to reduce their pesticide use. So it's very effective. So what are my con conclusions? Um, I think that looking forward into the next 20 years, demonstrating the safety and benefits of new products is going to be much harder than it's ever been before. Some of those products are going to be more complex than a lot of the products we currently deal with, and the regulation pipeline is going to struggle to keep up with some of those new products. And consumers are more demanding of this information. They want to know what's been put onto their uh, fruit and vegetables and other products when, uh, when, they, when they've been produced. I think robust research is really needed to generate this information. It doesn't come out of thin air. You do need to do some research to understand what the safety and benefits of new products are. I do think that Australian producers have the potential to show real leadership and around stewardship of pesticides and some of the potentially quite complex novel pest control products that are coming onto the market. I think that's been the case in the past and I think it can potentially be the case in the future. But this will only happen if they have the knowledge to do so. And my final take home message is that I think publicly funded R&D organisations, not just CSIRO, but also our universities and our state departments as well, are really crucial to delivering some of this stewardship knowledge in the future. And that's, I just want to end up by thanking all, all for listening. Thank you.